Hi, I'm Hall Davidson, and welcome back to KOCE TV series on Copyright for Educators. All the resources you see here are available online at copyrighteducation.org and copyrighteducation.info. Go to that site, download everything. It'll really supplement what you're seeing now. Now, when talking about copyright, there is nothing more intriguing or exciting for educators than fair use. Fair use is the concept that if you're doing something for the greater good of society, like teaching, for example, then your needs supersede the ownership rights of the copyright holder under the Copyright Act, that is, under the law. So teachers and by association students can legally use music, websites, video, print, images, and the whole realm of copyrighted material for the purposes of teaching. Education under the law is more important than Disney or Time Warner or Viacom. Nice. This means there is material you can use without asking permission and without paying. Now there are limitations and you do want to pay attention to them. But you should feel that copyright is more your friend than your enemy for the purposes of good instructional practices. Now let me say right off that the biggest limitation on classroom use of material is material that was designed for sale to the classroom. If a publisher has a book or sheet music for the orchestra or an online media library that was meant to sell to classrooms, then you should pay for that if you want to use it. That is the business of those businesses. And the courts would say that it's for the greater good of society that those businesses exist too. But most things teachers worry about, music from popular CDs, popular entertainments, images from websites, these things were not created for the classroom, but it doesn't mean that the teacher can't use them in the classroom, again, with an eye on the restrictions. Again, copyright is usually your friend. So let's look at the limitations first. But isn't it great to know that we live in a country where education is valued when it comes to intellectual property rights? Education, more important than most of the intellectual property rights held by other folks. Okay, first, let's look at what rights a copyright holder does have before we try to apply fair use. Now, copyright holders have the exclusive rights for reproduction, for derivative works, for distribution, transfer of ownerships, public performance, and public display. What is important for educators to realize is that Section 107 of the Copyright Act put limitations on these exclusive rights. That means that there are uses that override the normal rights of a copyright holder. Let's look at where these limitations apply. There are situations where intellectual property rights are limited. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Look at these last items on the list in Section 107 of the law. You see, teaching is important, and Congress put it in writing in Section 107 of the Copyright Act. For most people, this requires a little rethinking. So let's do a short quiz. Would you agree with the statement, the primary purpose of copyright law is to protect authors against the theft of their work? Here's a clue. This is under a giant banner reading things that are wrong. The answer is false. In truth, the primary objective of copyright is not to reward the labor of authors, but to promote the progress of science and useful arts. This is neither unfair nor unfortunate. Now, those aren't my words. Whose words are those? Those are the words of Sandra Day O'Connor, who was a member of the Supreme Court when she wrote those, ruling on a copyright case. She was quoting, as you'll see, from the Constitution of the United States. These are the words the Founding Fathers wrote. And when they wrote the word science back in the late 1700s when the Constitution was written, they meant science as the advancement of knowledge. The advancement of knowledge. That's the business of education. So that's the limitation on intellectual property rights. If you are doing that, then you can use material without permission or without payment. Now, there are only certain reasons, certain times when you can do that, and here they are. Teaching, scholarship, research being the most applicable one for educators. Remember that these are the important things. It does not apply to entertainment or to reward. If you are showing movies to students at lunchtime for entertainment or after school for reward for good attendance, something like that, 
then you are not exempt from copyright restrictions. Those are not fair use. You can use movies in this way in a school, but you have to pay for the rights to do that. Some entertainment giants have made it possible to do this in an easy way. You send a fax, uh, let's say to Disney, pay a fee of less than $50, and you're good to go. This is not fair use, however. This is just regular commercial licensing. So remember, just because you're in a school doesn't mean you can do anything that you want. If you're using copyrighted materials for face-to-face -face instruction in a classroom, you have a lot of leeway that you don't have when you're not doing those things. Okay, also, here's some things you need to know. Consumable print materials are not for copying. These are things that were designed for sale to schools on a one-to-one -one basis. If you like consumables, then it's in your interest to keep those companies afloat, pay for those things. That's the law. Now, if one remarkable day all the scantrons get rained on but one and you have to use them that day, well, you have an understanding of fair use now, I hope. But understand that you do have to pay for uses such as these. Remember that face-to-face -face instruction can trump intellectual property holder rights in ways that are important for face-to-face -face instruction. But copyrighted work always remains the property of the copyright holder, including derivative works, which are under that. Okay, so here are some other restrictions to pay attention to. The material must be used legitimately. and That is, it must be legitimately acquired. Yeah, you can't use a piece of music to emphasize the patriotic nature of a soldier or to emphasize the emotional pain of loss or some other uh, thing like that. But if the music came to you bootlegged, you can't do it. If the CD was legitimately purchased or bought on a download, for example, that's okay. But you can only use legitimately acquired works. Also, give the citation for the work when you use it. Remember, you didn't ask for permission. Uh, you didn't pay for it. You're using it in a face-to-face -face environment. That's fine. You must give the citation. Now, that's good practice anyway. Students should be doing that all the time in the information age for a lot of good reasons, not the least of which is so that you can find it again when you need it. For teachers, of course, the same thing is true. Another thing, the teaching situation where the copyrighted materials is being, are being used needs to be at the instance and inspiration of a single teacher. A superintendent, for example, can't say, everyone will use this image from the CNN website to teach about the Balkans. Fair use exemptions in the Section 107 are to remove obstacles from the teachable moment. They are for teachers, and they are not intended to be a wholesale circumvention of the normal process of acquiring instructional materials. Now, I think it's interesting to know what the courts, including the Supreme Court, look at when they review copyright cases. Uh, this is because a lot of people, including large companies, will sometimes say, hey, fair use, fair use. You know, yes, we used other materials. Yes, we didn't pay, but it was all for fair use. It's not just teachers that, this is, that have ever <laughs> used the words fair use. So when judges see a case and they ask themselves whether something is fair use or not, they look at four factors. Here they are. They're not equal, by the way, these four factors. The first is the purpose and character of the use. That's a big one. Uh, what are you using it for, in other words? Are you using this snatch, uh, the snippet of music from a CD for an educational purpose? Then that's okay. Education is a very good leg to stand on. The second of the four factors is the nature of the work. What was it intended for? Uh, if it was intended for sale to the schools, that would work against an educational use unless you're paying for it. Next would be the amount and substance of the work. It's the third of the four factors. Oh, I only used 60 seconds, you might say. Yeah, but it was only the good 60 seconds of the work and the only reason anybody ever bought it. Uh, that happened to a, a large uh, and famous magazine that published an excerpt from a book, and it was really the only part of the book anybody would have ever purchased. So the court said this was not fair use when you published that, even though you were reporting on it as if you were news. Okay, so those are the things that can work against you. The last is the effect on the market. This is also a big one, and this is a case where education, again, has a pretty uh, firm leg to stand on. When you use something in the classroom, ask yourself, are you diminishing the commercial value of that work? A lot of times, educational uses of songs or images in a classroom will not negatively affect the market for that work, and that's a good thing. So the four factors that the Supreme Court or other judges would use are valuable as reference points. But for educators, common sense works pretty well, too. 
think about this when you're trying to decide something to use in your classroom. And you're going to be using fair use. You know it belongs to someone else, belongs, it's intellectual property, it's copyrighted, and you're asking yourself, should I use this in a classroom? Ask yourself this. Are you doing anything that would harm the copyright holder? Are you compromising the value of the work? Are you doing something that would make them lose sale? Is their product diminished? And are you helping kids learn? Because if you answer all those correctly, then it may well be that your use of the copyrighted materials meets both the common sense and the legal guidelines, which is pretty nice. Now, there are guidelines for fair use agreed upon by copyright holders and educators. They had meetings. They agreed on certain things. Go to our website, copyrighteducation.org. Download these. Handy little charts. Print them out. Keep them in a classroom. It's good to know exactly what you can do under fair use. Remember, fair use is not a wild uh, get out of jail free card to use everything. There are limitations. The number of pages, the number of words in a book, the number of poems, the number of images from a particular collection. Uh, there's no need to go over these now because they're all online at our website. So go download those. Take a look at those. And remember, these are guidelines. Guidelines. In general, you should know that material like this can be used to support your teaching. Follow the guidelines and you're going to be okay. I think uh, also uh, you will find fascinating the individual pieces we have about video, music examples, and lots of other very interesting stuff that's on that website. So go there, download that, have, a, uh, I hope, a good and fascinating time learning about what you can do under fair use. So our next topic, and we cover all these topics specifically, videos, music, and so forth. The next one will be videos and technologies on the web. So come back, watch that show, and thank you for watching.